Hello, my name is Regina. For those of you who don't know me, um, for some some time now, I've been um, wanting to put my testimony on video, and um, lately, I've really been feeling like um, God has really been um, working on my heart about doing it. Um, it's a really hard and emotional thing for me to talk about, and. Um, I have it all written down so I'm basically gonna just be like um, looking at my paper a lot um, because um, it's very long and I'm gonna try to shorten it as much as possible but um, I think that the details are important um, for me to get down and on video and um, I just wanted to say that if you're watching this video and um, you have a women's group or ladies group in church or otherwise and you need someone um, to speak and just come and be encouraging, um, I would love to be that person uh, to come and speak to your group. Um, I'm not um, a professional um, speaker. I've only spoke in front of people just a handful of times. Um, and when I say handful, like less than five. Um, but I just really feel like um, in this day and age and time um, that God is um, really wanting me to um, get my testimony out there and to just share my heart with people and just try to make a difference in other people's lives. And um, I'm really nervous about it, but um, I feel like for a long time, God's been wanting me to do that. So um, I'm going to um, take a step and um, try to do that. So here I go. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my husband and I met in uh, 1995, and we were both 18 years old, newly graduated from high school, just... Um, I guess about maybe six months out of high school and we met and um, it was love at first sight um, but um, we had a couple of bumps in the road and we dated for um, about a month and then life just got in the way and we um, you know had things going on in our lives and um, so we uh, didn't date for a couple of months and then um, in January of uh, 1996 we um, got back together and we've been together ever since um, we've uh, been married uh, 22 years and um, I am uh, very proud of that fact it hasn't been an easy road um, marriage is not easy for those of you who have been married for a while um, you know what I'm talking about and um, for those of you who haven't been married very long um, just know that um, if you just keep loving each other and keep forgiving each other that it's going to work out um, and uh, you can do it. <laughs> so um, in uh, April of 2000 we had uh, my daughter Hannah and uh, we were just like so happy. She was just like our whole world. Um, she was actually kind of unexpected. We weren't trying to um, have uh, children for like three years um, we didn't want to have my husband should I say um, wasn't ready to have children um, you know right away and uh, I was just kind of open for whenever it happened um, but on our one-year anniversary uh, we conceived Hannah and so in April of 2000 she was born so um, I quit my job as an orthodontic assistant to stay home with my daughter. Um, two and a half years later, we bought our first house in Gainesville, Texas. And shortly after our daughter turned three, I found out I was pregnant again. Surprise, another surprise. So um, I remember the day so clearly when I had my sonogram. We found out we were having a boy and my husband was so excited, um, but I wasn't so excited. Um, because I wanted another girl. Um, I loved having a girl and um, I just thought, you know, who wants a stinky little boy? And, uh, but my husband did. And um, so he was super excited. And um, so I was happy, you know, for him that he was gonna get his boy and I had my girl and we were just gonna be, you know, just a little happy family. And uh, two was all he wanted. 
Um, so I'll just put that in there. Um, I was up for having four children, um, but his limit was like two. So um, anyways, I, I was just like, okay, you know, there's my chance. Um, it's gone. You know, I'm not going to get to buy any more bows or dresses. You know, I'm just worried about not having a girl and all of this. And so um, I just didn't know what I was going to do with the boy because um, although I had worked in daycare and babysat children many years um, and I had plenty of experience with boys and I just preferred girls. I'm just a girl person. So um, about five people had given me boxes of boy clothes as soon as I announced what I was having. I washed clothes for days and I remember going to the store and buying dress, dress soap so that the baby's clothes would be allergy free. I had all of the clothes hung up and put away in a dresser. And after doing all of that, I was ready for my little boy. I just couldn't wait until I got to hold him in my arms and nurse him for the first time. But when I was six and a half months pregnant, on October the 16th, 2003, my life changed. I was invited by a friend to go to a mom's meeting in Sherman, Texas, a 30 minute drive from my house. We went to the meeting, taking both of our three year old daughters with us who had become fast best friends. We had lunch at the local mall after mops and we shopped around for a few hours before heading back home around 3 p.m. I remember chatting with my friend who was driving us in her husband's truck. I was sitting in I was sitting in the front passenger seat. My daughter was sitting behind me and my friend's daughter was sitting behind her. For a few minutes I remembered that we didn't talk. Suddenly, my friend put her arm across me and I heard her scream. But I couldn't make out what she said. The next thing I know, I'm waking up, looking at a man in a blue uniform, holding an IV bag. Through the broken windshield on the hood of the truck I was riding in. I heard my friend tell me that, I heard my friend tell someone else that I was six months pregnant. I was so confused and it all felt like a dream. I grabbed at my stomach and I thought, oh no, the baby. And then frantically, I tried to move, but I couldn't because my legs were pinned down by the dash of the truck. I was stuck. Right before I passed back out, I tried to look behind me because I heard my daughter crying. I saw out of the corner of my eye that she was being pulled across the seat to the left of me while still in her car seat by a paramedic. In front of me, I saw a dump truck and it looked to be a few, a few yards away from us. I have no other memories of the accident. I was told that it was an hour and a half later that the jaws of life finally freed me. I was care flighted to Parkland in Dallas. What had happened was that a dump truck ran a stop sign off of Highway 82 right outside of Sherman, Texas and pulled directly in front of us. My friend did not have time to do anything. The impact was only on my side of the truck in the front because once he saw us coming, he hit his brakes. All because a man was in hurry in a hurry, my life was changed forever. Luckily for my friend, her husband was actually on his way towards us to conduct business in Sherman. He was only 10 minutes away. I was so thankful that my friend's husband was able to be there with her and her daughter so quickly. When I awoke a few days later, five days later, I was wearing a neck brace. I had pressure boots on my feet, the kind that fill with air and then deflate and I had a tube down my throat and up my nose and all kinds of wires on me. The blood pressure cuff was way too tight and it bothered me tremendously. I freaked out when I woke up and I tried pulling things off of me and out of me. 
the nurse had to calm me down. They, tri they tied my hands to the side of the bed. A nurse inserted the tube back down my throat and up my nose. And boy, was that not pleasant. It hurt so bad. I was gagging and crying. I was angry and I was confused. I finally promised not to pull the tubes and the wires. And then they untied me. They gave me more drugs and I was in and out of consciousness. The first thing I remembered when waking up was that I just knew that my baby had not survived. I just knew. I could hardly speak because of the tube down my throat. I said to my husband, the baby, Hannah, tears streamed down my face when he said that our son did not make it. And then relief flooded me when I heard that the joy of my life, my daughter, was okay. Had she not made it, I surely would have given up. She had suffered a mild concussion, but by the time, but by that time that I woke up, she was already out of the hospital and doing well. My friend who was driving had a broken arm and a bruised knee. Her daughter was untouched. The driver of the dump truck had a few broken ribs. The fact that I was alive was a miracle. My time on earth was not done. My friend drove her husband's truck that day instead of her small car. I call that the hand of God. I had a talk with my brother when he came to see me in ICU. I said something along the lines of, you never know when it's going to be your time to go. So I hope that you will be ready when that time comes. With the help of my mother, he went home and he prayed a prayer of salvation that night. In Romans 8:28, it says that we know that all things work together for the good to those that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. I had so many visitors right away. Once I was removed from ICU, I don't remember my mom or my husband leaving my side. Others came in to see me and pray with me and I felt so loved and so important and sad and alone. I cried myself to sleep every night I was in the hospital. I don't remember too much about my stay at Parkland because I was drugged heavily. I had a morphine button, but because my heart was broken and I wanted to go to sleep and I never wanted to wake up. But then I would think of my daughter and my husband and my family. And I knew that I had to get better quick it all felt like a dream. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. I wondered why I was still alive. Why didn't God just let me die instead of enduring the physical and the emotional pain? My injuries were a four inch cut on the back of my head, a broken right arm, a broken right thigh bone, internal bleeding, from my spleen and other areas. Bruised from head to toe, small cuts all over me from blind glass, and a fractured pelvis. I also had a six inch surgical incision on my right thigh where a metal rod was inserted to fix my broken femur. A three inch surgical incision on my right arm where a metal plate was screwed to the bone to fix the break in my arm. I had metal pins in my wrist and one on my knuckle and one on my ring finger. I had a nine, I had a nine inch surgical incision for a vertical C-section. My husband told me he didn't recognize me. He said it looked as if someone had beat me all over my body with the baseball bat. The OBGYN doctor had told me that I would, I would be able to have a baby again once, uh, one day. He said, you'll be able to have a baby again. I thought to myself, I don't want another baby. I want the baby I just had. When my husband told me that they decided to have the funeral without me, I was so angry.
I wanted to jump out of bed and escape the hospital. The problem with that plan was that I couldn't I could not walk with a broken leg. Of course I cried and I begged him to wait on me. He said that he couldn't and that it would be a close casket and no one would see him either. He told me that he decided to name him Grayson because since I was out of it and I wasn't able to make the decision on his name. While I was unconscious, Grayson was placed in my left hand with my husband's hand under mine and someone took a picture. I treasure that picture along with all the other pictures that were taken of him. There were pictures of his dad, his grandparents, and other family members holding him. My husband did not allow our daughter Hannah to see him or go to the funeral. Everything about what had happened to me was out of my control. I did not like it. Other people were in control of me and I did not, I did not like it one bit. In my heart, I knew that the one who was really in control was God. I had to learn to trust him. A week after the accident, a physical therapist came into my room and told me I was going to get up on my own. I thought she had to be smoking crack. I ended up, it ended up being very painful sitting on the side of my bed with my legs hanging down. That's all I could do. The next day, I somehow managed very slowly and painfully on the side of my bed and then onto a potty chair next to my bed. I was so glad to get rid of that bedpan. Every time the nurses had to change my bed sheets, it caused me extreme pain to roll over from one side to another. At times, I really could have preferred to just sit in my own mess rather than to have to roll from one side to the other. Don't judge. <laughs> you just can't even imagine how painful moving was for me. One day, my friend Kayla came to see me. She said, you're a friend. She said she was going to fix my hair. Four hours of painful combing through a bloody, knotty mess. And with dry shampoo. That was when dry shampoo first came out, I guess. That's the first I had heard of it. Yet I was so thankful for her and her perseverance and dedication to making my hair look as decent as possible. The doctors had to shave the back of my head to stitch up the large cut so that I was missing a chunk of hair in the back. I'm guessing part of God's plan was to squash the small amount of vanity that I had recently developed. I did love looking at myself in the mirror. After uh, two weeks in Parkland Hospital, I was transferred to Denton Regional for physical therapy and care of my injuries. The reason I was transferred there is because it was the closest hospital to my husband's job and our home. At first, the people in charge of my care were not going to let me go there, but instead they wanted to send me to another hospital in Dallas-Fort Worth. My father-in-law had a connection at Denton Regional and was there, was therefore able to get me transferred there and answered prayer. I was so thankful. Denton Regional was the hospital that I had my daughter at just three and a half years prior. I knew that hospital and I knew that that's where my um, OB doctor was, who had also been taking care of me during my pregnant pregnancy with my son. The ambulance ride from Dallas to Denton was pure torture for me. It was the first time that I was in a vehicle since the accident. I was in a box that was swaying back and forth and hitting bumps in the road. It caused me physical pain and mental anguish. I asked the paramedic for oxygen. Of course, they billed me for it. Since I had a broken arm, a right on I had a broken right arm, my hand and my wrist, I was not able to use crutches. At this point, I was still in a wheelchair. My first full day at Denton Regional Therapy, I was given a walker with an armrest and a handle on it. I had begun my long road to recovery. I had to do rehab two times a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. It was very exhausting to me. I was only able to sleep for a few hours at night for many reasons. Needing to go to the restroom often, which in itself was not an easy feat. I had a blood pressure cuff on my arm. Nurses were in and out of my room. 
they were checking on my roommate and I, and my roommate was an older lady and she was snoring all the time. I was also replaying the accident in my head and grieving my son and missing my husband and my daughter. Two things that helped me were when I was able to get a fan in my room and when my husband brought me headphones with an old school CD player attached and a stack of CDs. Thank you, Cousin Christy. The nurses always woke us up at 7 a.m. for us to start our day. I had two different roommates while I was there. I was very blessed that they were both, both very nice elderly Christian ladies. One had a knee surgery and the other had a hip surgery. As a matter of fact, I was the only pa patient under the age of 70. I was able to visit with the other patients during meal times if I chose to go to the dining room. We also played table games. I enjoyed the company of the other patients. I had lots of visitors while I was at regional. Some days it was overwhelming. At times I just wanted to curl into a ball and tell everyone to go away. I felt like I had to put on a strong face for everyone. When my OB doctor came to check on me and look at my staples in my stomach, he said that all was healing well and he would be back to remove the staples in a few days. He tried to, take, he tried to make me take antidepressants. I told him I didn't want any. I wanted to go through my grief and not medicate it. This was just me. I knew what I could handle and I knew God was carrying me. It wasn't easy. I'm glad I never took antidepressants. Some people need to at times and that's okay. Everyone is different. After spending Halloween in rehab, I begged my social worker to get me released and to let me go home. At first I was told no, you have to stay two more weeks. After making a few phone calls to various people, my social worker told me that she had arranged for me to go home and do home health care for two weeks. And then I was going to do rehab at the Gainesville Hospital, outpatient rehab. I also had to get my blood checked at the Gainesville Hospital once a week for a couple of months to monitor the thickness of my blood since I was still on blood thinners. A month after the accident, I was finally home in my bed. For the first couple of weeks, we had meals given to us by church members from the Denton Church of God and Denton Mops from First Baptist Church Denton. My friend Jennifer, thank you Jennifer, she took up an offering from her Sunday school class at First Baptist Church in Denton and the Denton Mops group. We were so thankful for all of the help, the food, and the prayers. All of that eventually tapered off to nothing except for my friend who had been driving in the accident came by often to help me with house chores and making sure that we had food to eat. Thank you, Gina. I also had two neighbors who checked on me throughout the week. The day after Christmas, I had my husband take me to buy a cane. I bought a white cane with purple flowers on it, of course. If I was going to use a cane, I thought, well, I might as well look stylish. Sometime in January of 2004, I decided I no longer wanted to take painkillers. I had already cut down my dose of them by half as they made me feel weird and sleep all, all of the time, and I didn't want to get hooked on them. I didn't have time for that. I had a little girl, a husband, and a house to take care of. So I lived on over-the-counter painkillers such as Aleve ibuprofen for the next six months. The thing that was the hardest for me was not crying in front of my three-year-old and my husband. If I had to do it all, all, all over again, I lost my place. If I had to do it all over again, I would have just cried in front of them. About six months after the accident, I bought two balloons. I told my daughter we were going to let them go into the sky and send them to her brother. She asked why we couldn't go up to heaven and give them to him. I fought back the tears as I told her, in three-year-old terms, that once you go to heaven, you don't come back to earth. I said one day, we're all going to go to heaven and we're going to see him, but not until God lets us. Some things that helped me through my grief were talking out my feelings to friends and family who would listen. I did go to counseling a few times, and that was very helpful. 
I prayed a lot and I cried a lot at night. I wrote in a journal. I planted a memory garden. Once I received a settlement from the accident, I opened up a children's resale store. I didn't realize at the time that it was wonderful therapy for me to be able to set up baby beds and decorate them. One would think that it would have done the opposite for me, but I got to wash and dry and fold clothes, hang up clothes. I got to clean toys and arrange them on the shelf, paint the walls yellow. The very color I would have chosen for my son's room had he lived. In a sense, I was setting up my missing son's baby room. That was some expensive therapy. I think that had I not opened the store, I would have gone crazy sitting at home with nothing to do. The store get, did great for the first six months, and then the economy got bad. I also had decided to homeschool my daughter, and we bought a house about 15 minutes from the store. So things changed, and I lo no longer wanted to be the store owner. So after exactly one year of business, I closed up the shop. So at this point, I was living um, where I live now. A year after the accident, I co-founded an infant loss support group with a new friend of mine. We had three other mothers and one father join our group. We met for one year. We all stayed in touch with each other via Facebook. The group was instrumental in pushing me towards healing in my journey of grief. Although for the next three years, I still dealt with the agony of several family members and friends who had given birth to babies the exact age or within my son's age of what my son would have been. Baby showers, pregnancy announcements, births, etc. were all pure torture to me for many, many years. I miscarried a year and a half after losing Grayson. At, I was six weeks um, pregnant with my third child. That added to my grief. Then the doctor diagnosed me with Factor V Leiden. My blood was clotting too much. I now have to take a baby aspirin daily. My husband and I continued to try to conceive another child with no luck. December of 2005, we received our license to be foster parents, foster adopt parents. In January 2006, we got a call to take a 10-month-old baby. I'll call him Baby N. He was with us for four months. Our second foster baby came in September of 2006. I just knew he was the one. He was three months old. He had black wavy hair and light brown skin. He was beautiful to me. He had been in foster care since he was just a few days old. His previous foster mother had not been taking care of him. A few months later, although we still had baby Jay, I accepted another boy who was 15 months old. I'll call him baby C. Four months later, baby C went to live with his aunt. My husband and I adopted baby Jay in November of 2007 when he was 16 months old. Exactly a year later, we adopted my 10-year-old cousin. She is now in her 20s. God gave us double for our trouble. Or is that double trouble? <laughs> it's now been 12 years. Well, not 12 years. When I wrote this, it was 12 years. It's been 16 years. And my husband and I still have not been able to, we still have not been able to conceive children. We feel so blessed that God has allowed us to add to our family by adoption. Our infertility infertility caused a lot of stress and a lot of fights between us. It tore us apart. It took away the intimacy we once shared. We, we grew apart, and in the fall of 2008 is when I noticed a difference in his behavior towards me. Eventually, he and I both found someone else to meet our emotional needs. I wanted a divorce and I told him that I didn't love him anymore. I didn't feel the release from God and 
that it was the right thing to do. So we both did the best we could do to move on. April of 2013, things exploded between us again, and we had put a temporary Band-Aid on our problems. Nothing had been solved. I went to a divorce attorney, and I talked with them. I did not file, but I was seriously considering it. That night, he pleaded with me to give our love another chance. I told him that he had to go to counseling with the pastor. We agreed to meet with our pastor as a couple. After meeting with them, it was decided that we needed to talk one-on-one. -on -one. My husband with the pastor and me with the pastor's wife. So through counseling and prayer, we were able to find our love for each other again. I'm here to tell you there is hope. Nothing is impossible for my God. Backtracking a little bit in the middle of our band-aid time. In November of 2012, my husband's Aunt Betty passed away. On the four-hour drive to his aunt's funeral, I was feeling emotional, missing her, and on top of that, missing my son, because we had just had our ninth Thanksgiving without him. My husband asked me to drive the last half of the way there. I agreed, although I felt very uneasy about it. Ten minutes down the highway, doing 70 miles an hour, while diesels whizzed by me going 80 miles an hour, I started feeling dizzy. My head hurt. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't see well. I was shaking. I was so confused, I felt like it was a dream. I heard a voice say, you're going to crash, and you're going to die, and you're going to kill your whole family. That scared me even more. I felt the urge to pull the steering wheel to the left and crash into the cement wall. I told the voice no in my head. I was fighting a spiritual battle. I didn't let the devil win. I woke my husband up and told him what was happening. There was no place to exit for miles. I pulled right over into the grass on the side of the highway. I climbed into the back seat of the van and I cried. My kids and husband didn't understand what had happened. I didn't understand what had happened. I had a full-blown panic attack. Up until that point, I had not ever had a panic attack since the day of the accident. I had never been scared to drive. A little nervous and hesitant, maybe, during the first year after the accident, but never terrified like I was that day. Once we were home from Aunt Betty's funeral, I couldn't even drive my car down the driveway just to go move it out of the way for my husband. I felt paralyzed when I got in and I started backing up. I knew I needed to go see my doctor, and he diagnosed me with PTSD. Of course, he tried to put me on antidepressants. I declined telling him that I trust God for my healing. Good thing that my doctor is also a pastor of a church. He understood. He gave me a prescription anyways, a very mild one. He said to fill it or not, it's your choice. I filled it, but I never took it. As the weeks went by, I got better at driving to town, 15 minutes away. I have driven on the highway a handful of times, and my anxiety was coming back. And it really just depends on my stress level at the time of the driving. As of August the 14th, I still had anxiety when I drove. Maybe the purpose of my driving anxiety is to slow down and not be so busy, to spend more time with God. To be still. Maybe it's for the purpose of helping someone that's going to go through it one day. Whatever the reason, it is my cross to bear until God decides to heal me. March of 2014, I was at a women's retreat with some friends of mine. The speaker challenged us to go to our hotel room to find a quiet space and pray alone. She said, listen to God's voice and ask him if he wants us to share anything with the group when we get back. I had already told God, I had already heard God speak to me that he wanted me to share with the group. And although I wasn't sure what he wanted me to share at the time, I went to my room and I grabbed a book I had been reading titled, Your Scars Are Beautiful to God. I turned to chapter 6. That chapter talks about restoring the broken heart and forgiveness. The the verse on the page is Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to pro proclaim freedom for the captives 
and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The words I read jumped out at me. God softly said to me, I am sending you to help heal the brokenhearted. You will comfort others who mourn. I had been wanting to start a grief share group at my church, and God had confirmed that that was exactly what I was supposed to do. There was more. He also said that I was going to tell my story to other women, and they would be changed by hearing it. He said that my story would give others hope. I also learned that day that I needed to forgive myself and forgive others who had hurt me. Forgiving yourself is the hardest person to forgive. I thought to myself that day, God can't use a sinner like me. I felt disqualified. God says in his word that those he qualifies, that those he calls, he qualifies. I am called because he called me. We all have an assignment on this earth, a purpose. God could have easily allowed me to die on October the 16th, 2003. But he still had a purpose for me. I'm so glad he did. I get to tell others that Jesus is Lord. He can heal your broken heart. He can take what the devil meant for harm and he can turn it into good. The car accident, the grief of losing our son. I lost my grandmother a year after I lost my son and other family members and friends. We adopted, we struggled through infertility. We had financial issues. We had marital problems. We uh, lived through a second story addition, which is actually not even finished yet. Um, I've gone through anxiety, fear, spiritual warfare, have all taken a toll on my life and my marriage. It's truly a miracle of God that I'm still married. My faith has wavered, but God has never given up on me. He will never leave us or forsake us. Now, you know, I don't have it all together. I'm still a work in progress. I'm willing to bet that no one watching this video has it all together either. I just want you to realize that we are all beautifully broken and the only one who can piece us back together and make us new again is Jesus Christ. I hope that if you haven't given your broken pieces to Jesus that you will make a choice and do so today. So as of uh, right now making this video like I said um, it's been 16 years since we lost our son and our adopted son is now 14 and um, our birth daughter Hannah is now 20 and um, they're both still living at home with us and I feel so blessed that that's the case and um, although we still have daily struggles um, which I'll talk about in another video um, with our adopted son um, and then just you know life in general um, you know, God's there. He's there for us, and um, I'm so thankful that I have him to lean on. I hope that um, this helped you um, build your faith, and I hope that you will call on Jesus in your time of need. Thank you.